Good morning. Today I'll be reading Nehemiah 1, verses 4 through 11. Nehemiah 1, verses 4 through 11. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, I beseech you, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel which have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes or the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you have been, who have been scattered were in the most remote parts of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name, and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. All right, as usual, good job, Chaz. I appreciate you so much. And Man, Ronnie Bobo, what a great job leading that song, huh? That was, uh, that was awesome. And uh, many of you are going, who is that guy? He's one of our uh, new members, and, and uh, he's a DeKalb police sergeant. So if he stops you this week, say, here's my driver's license. By the way, you did a great job with that song Sunday. <laughs> and uh, he'll, uh, he'll, he'll still write you up. But uh, no. he's a great, great guy. He looks like he can handle himself pretty well, doesn't he? So that's, that's, I think every song leader ought to have that. You either sing or I'll crush your leg, you know, anyway. So uh, I, w- I want to say thank you guys for being here today. And, and I know we've come to worship and, 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 and we've got a lot of visitors. And I, we just appreciate every one of you, okay? And, and, uh, but Colette, I want to say um, welcome back. I know it's just a brief uh, time. But we haven't seen you since you've been married. So stand up real quick. See, here, here's Colette. This is what a married, oh yeah. So she's not very, she is standing, by the way. It's, <laughs> it's, it's sad, but anyway, thank you. Uh, anyway, she did marry someone taller, and we're happy about that. And it was in a, a ceremony that took place in another country. She said in three and a half minutes. So we're, we're not sure if it's legal, but we're super happy. <laughs> really happy with Colette, but anyway, uh, anyway, I wanted to say something because we, w- we weren't invited to the wedding. <laughs> anyway, it's no big deal. My feelings still are hurt. <laughs> anyway, you got your Bible open to the book of Nehemiah, and, and uh, we're going to uh, just try in the next couple of weeks to... Um, to, to talk about uh, Nehemiah and learn some incredible lessons. Normally when Nehemiah is studied, they, people talk about the leadership of Nehemiah, and certainly um, there, there are leadership skills that Nehemiah has and, and uh, that we're going to learn from, but we're really talking about building. And many of you, some of you are physically building something right now, so, several in this auditorium building a home or a business. Some of you are bu- building a marriage, uh, uh, you're, you're building uh, literally a home, you're getting ready to have children and, and start a family. Um, some of you are building a reputation, and whatever you're building, I believe Nehemiah has some great words for you today um, in that building, building process. Nehemiah, as you know, is a cupbearer of the king, Artaxerxes uh, Longamus. He, uh, he's not just any king, he is a a king that would reign during a special time. You would probably know his, his grandfather. His grandfather was a king that was ruling when a young woman by the name of Esther uh, was uh, chosen as his, uh, he would choose as his wife. And Esther would literally save um, the people of Israel. 
uh, there would be no one to go back tr to Jerusalem had it not been for Mordecai and Esther and the story. Did you know in your Bible, actually, those books are together? The book of Ezra, the book of Nehemiah, and the book of Esther. Uh, e Esther. So you got Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. In the Hebrew Bible, they're actually combined. The book of uh, es uh, Ezra and Nehemiah are combined. They are not separated. They are s sister stories, if you will. Ezra would go back and begin to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. I mentioned last week in an introduction about the broken things being uh, rebuilt, that it was um, three waves that went back. A guy by the name of Zerubbabel would take back the first wave. Ezra would take back a second wave. And Nehemiah would take back a third wave. Um, and some, uh, uh, maybe two to three million Jews have been displaced and taken to Babylon. And yet only about 50,000 return with these three waves. And as they returned, they begin to rebuild uh, the, the city, they rebuild the temple, there are enemies there, and th they want to thwart the effort of the rebuilding of Jerusalem, but it means something. So the lesson this morning is entitled, Does Anybody Really Care? Does Anybody Really Care? Um, there was a man who was a deacon in our congregation in Fort Lauderdale where I preached for almost eight years before we moved here, and I would always ask him, how are you doing today, Huey? And he would always say the same thing. Do you really care? Yeah. <laughs> and after a while, I really didn't, you know. <laughs> we don't want to even ask that question anymore. Hey, are you okay? Are you all right? You see someone crying, you know. Uh, Kay always says <laughs> to me, we're going in a store and, you, you know, we both have different strengths. She has so many great strengths, and, and one of them is to uh, keep me locked on, uh, focused. And we're going into a store, and Kay will say to me, don't make, don't, don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact. <laughs> the whole time. I was like looking around, seeing who I can talk to. Don't make eye contact with these people. You know, just let them go, you know. They have these poor salespeople, you know, you go into Sam's or a place like that, and they're, you know, they're right there at the front door. Don't make eye contact with them. What's sad is we're a lot like that. We don't want to make eye contact with anybody anymore. We don't want to know. You know, and, and, and maybe it's, uh, there is a part of us that's a little jaded. We, first of all, to ask a question may be to get us involved. You know, if we said, hey, are you okay? And somebody said, no, I'm not. Then the question is, do you really care? So, so I, I, I like this outline. I, I kind of uh, uh, borrowed it from a guy named Warren Wearsby. And he shows in his, uh, kind of that I borrowed, he showed four ways that uh, Nehemiah cared. And I like these, and I wanted to use them this morning as kind of a basis for the lesson that I want to teach. Not very long, but I think it's four ways that Nehemiah showed that, that he cared. First of all, he cared uh, enough to ask. Um, and I think that's the beginning point, is that do you care really enough to ask? Are you okay? Hey, is there anything that I can do for you? Um, you know, how can my family help you? How can our congregation help you? How? How is it that I can get involved in your life to help you so that you can come out of whatever that you're going through? Or maybe even you're going, doing something good and you're trying to accomplish something. How is, it, how is it that I can be involved? And so, first of all, he cared enough to ask. Uh, I remind you that what I told you last week is that Nehemiah was a cupbearer. Cupbearer was uh, meant something more than a modern-day butler. A cupbearer was uh, one other than his wife was the closest to the king. Uh, Artaxerxes would depend on Nehemiah to taste his food and his wine before he would take it because if it was poisoned, that's normally how you killed a monarch back then. If it were poisoned, Nehemiah would die, not the monarch. Uh, culturally speaking, for someone to be so close to the king, they would have to be good looking. They were handsome. They were smart. They had to be able to speak. Um, 
uh, different languages and also they had to converse uh, about politics and in various subjects because the king would ask the people around him sometimes their impression or their opinion on things and so Nehemiah wasn't just some you know uh, in the back of the palace guy he was someone that was seen every day in the presence of the king and he was an important person to the king and uh, to the kingdom now I want to stop and just say <laughs> Someone that close can either use their influence for good or evil. And there, there is no telling how many people that you are close to that they are watching your example, that they are seeing the way you live your life and the way you treat other people, that you yourself can use your influence. That's what I think leadership is. It's influence. That your influence can either be used for good or for evil. Uh, Nehemiah would now after a century uh, of this remnant going back um, after the city of Jerusalem has been sacked uh, by the Babylonians remember Nebuchadnezzar would go and it's kind of interesting it took him three waves to to uh, to, to literally destroy the city of Jerusalem and it takes three waves to send uh, people back but uh, Nehemiah is in Susa just like Esther was by the way in Susa in the right place at the right time just like just like Joseph was in Egypt, just like David was at the right place at the right time. That's what God does. He puts us where we need to be. If he wanted us somewhere else, he would move us somewhere else. But he puts us just where we need to be so that we can be an influence on the lives of other people. It had to be just a routine day. It was a day like any other day where he asked his brother Hananiah, as you see at the beginning, of the book of Nehemiah, how are things going he, uh, in uh, Jerusalem? He had just returned from a visit to Jerusalem, and uh, he said, not good at all. And so he begins to hear uh, a conversation, by the way, that would take place. Have you ever thought about things in the Bible that just started as just another day? You know, uh, Moses was out with the flocks. There was a burning bush. It was just another day. David was out in the field. Do you remember that when they came to anoint him king of Israel, they lined up his brothers who were all better looking, apparently more kingly looking, and finally they said, hey, is there anybody else in this house? Yeah, there's a guy named David. He's out in the field. It was just another day, David tending the flocks, when they brought him back in and he was anointed king of Israel. It was just another day when Peter and Andrew and James and John had been fishing. Remember, they had been fishing all night long. They hadn't caught anything. And Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. That's how God does his work. Through the ordinary, he takes an extraordinary moment. Like any other day you could have. Just think, today at lunch, you could have a conversation that literally could turn the life of someone around. You could encourage, you could instill courage in the heart of someone. Sometimes we think we need these incredible moments of, of, of being up front or standing in front of a great crowd of people when really God wants to use us, maybe sitting at a table somewhere, maybe, maybe standing in a grocery store. You never know just how, in that ordinary moment, how God can do extraordinary, extraordinary things. So some questions is that why would Nehemiah care? <clears throat> why would he care about a struggling Jerusalem? He's got it made. If he's, if he's uh, caring for the king and he's li literally living in luxury, why would he care about this remnant? Also, it wasn't his fault that the people sinned and got thrown into Babylonian captivity. He was probably born in captivity himself. So he's never been to Jerusalem. He has no good uh, uh, memories of Jerusalem other than the stories he has told, the songs that he has been singing and his, his parents taught him and the wonderful things that he has heard about the glory of, of Jerusalem. And so he begins to ask questions and with those questions comes some caring. Someone once said that information might bring obligation. <laughs> that is true. Um, I, I was told a long time ago, um, what you don't know can't hurt you. Have you ever heard that? That is not true. That is not true, folks. I want to tell you, our cemeteries are filled with people who have stuck their head in the sand and has said that adage that I just said, if, it, if you don't know it, then it won't hurt you. That is not true. 
is that sometime that information that comes to you will bring about some obligation in your life. You've got to do with whatever it is you need to do with the information that is told to you. Nehemiah asked about Jerusalem and the Jews that are living there, and he's got a caring heart. He really cares about people. This is something that you, that you love about Nehemiah, is that he, he really does care about people. He doesn't see them. He's never been there, and yet his heart is about these people. So he doesn't close his, his ears or his eyes to the tragedy that's happening all around. The, what, the words that come to Nehemiah are words like remnant, this isn't a massive group of people. This is a remnant. Words like ruin. This is not some magnificent city. It is a ruined city. It's in shambles. And then there was a reproach. Because of what it looked like and what they were going through, it was a reproach to other people. And so, so Nehemiah would hear these things, and with that information, of course, uh, he would begin to weep. Walls, gates, and uh, the temple were those things that he already knew that Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. They had begun to rebuild the temple. In fact, it took them in the book of Ezra, Ezra chapters 1 through 6, it takes them about 20, 25 years. There's enemies and, and the, the Gentiles uh, try to thwart the effort. And so they finally get this temple built, but there's still, the gates are burned. Um, the wall is, is in sections, is destroyed. And uh, so... He, he hears this information. Uh, you know, um, there's actually a proverb that talks about um, the walls of a broken city, that a man who lacks self-control is like uh, the walls of a city who's been torn down. And so it's the idea that when you have these gates that are burned and the city that's broken, that you've made yourself vulnerable to the enemies uh, around you. So Nehemiah was, wanted to hear the truth. And um, sometimes we don't want to hear that. It's, it's hard to hear. And, uh, but I think it's sometimes the best thing. Listen, y'all, it's better <clears throat> that you hear the truth so you can deal with it than to stick your head in the sand or to avoid that information. There was a young man that grew up in this congregation, and he went into Eggleston, and he was having some issues. And I guess at the time he was maybe about 19, uh, 19 years old. And they found a mass on his, uh, near his heart, and, um, and they, the doctors looked at it and examined it, and, um, and uh, they said, hey, listen, this does not look good at all. And they told him the worst case scenario of all of this information. And um, so his mother called me, and she said, hey, if you get a chance, just draw by the hospital and, and check on Jason. And so I did. I went the next day, as soon as I heard that he was in the hospital, and he found out this information. But right before I got to him, those same doctors, those same doctors came back into the room and said, hey, listen, we have a plan of how we're going to get rid of this. We have a plan of what we're going to do step by step. And he was a different person. He said, Harold, just hearing that there was some kind of hope, just hearing that would not that there's a problem, but how they were going to help take care of that problem, that information in and of itself, it meant something to me. And so, in fact, he still lives out in California. He's, he's still doing well today and uh, getting stronger, getting stronger every day. So, um, and, and that's, of course, that's a good part of that story. What I'm saying is he couldn't say to those doctors, whatever it is, don't tell me. He had, to be, he had to hear that information because you've got to know the information in order to know what to do. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Secondly, he cared enough to weep. Um, I'm, a, I'm a crier. I'm, uh, the older I get, I'm a major weeper. And um, I do, I cry at Publix commercials. I'm not, gonna, I'm not real proud of it. Um, I am. I'm not real proud of it. I do things that get to me, uh, 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 and then sometimes they sneak up on me. And um, I appreciated Monty Joseph said, you know, gosh, Harold, I've noticed the older I get, the more I'm crying. I said, yeah, join the you know, group. And, um, and it's, it's interesting what makes people cry and, um, or actually what makes them laugh. You know, some people laugh at your mistakes. They'll laugh at your heartache. 
Um, I think that what you laugh at and what you cry at has something to say about your character. And, um, and I think that Nehemiah, when he hears these words, the Bible actually says that he sits down and he mourns. He sits down and he weeps. He actually uh, is repeating what the Jews did when they were put into exile. They mourned, and their way of mourning was sitting down. They sat down and they wept. That's exactly what Nehemiah does. He sits down and he weeps. He joins, by the way, a long line of folks um, that are criers. Um, uh, Jesus being one of them. He weeps at uh, Lazarus' uh, funeral. Remember that? Even knowing he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he weeps over Jerusalem. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. His compassion for Jerusalem. The apostle Paul uh, weeps. The Bible's filled with people that cry. What makes you cry? And especially the souls of people, and it, in particular, this thing that was so dear to the Jews um, affected Nehemiah so much that it made him it made him cry, and um, so uh, he would sit down and pray. Li I think like Daniel, Nehemiah had a place that he went to pray. Now the Jews, uh, according to Leviticus 16, um, they only had to fast once a year, and the fasting was normally done during uh, the Day of Atonement, and but that's not what they do. What he does is for days, the Bible says, he's fasting and weeping and praying over Jerusalem. Nehemiah cares enough to weep. And I just want to ask you, what is it that makes you cry? And, um, and, you know, what is it that gets to you, to your heart? And how spiritual are those, are those uh, things? And then, um, and then he cared enough to pray. I told you we'd move through this pretty fast. He cared enough to pray. I love this prayer. In fact, the book of Nehemiah is a book of prayers. I love this. If, you, if you're trying to grow in your prayer life, please study the prayers of Nehemiah. Um, when you pray, pray like Nehemiah in that he concentrates on how great God is, not how poor he is. Oh, Lord, we just can't do anything down here. We don't have anything. That's not Nehemiah. Nehemiah says you are a great and awesome God. And if you have, by the way, a great and awesome problem, you're going to need a great and awesome God. And if you want to follow a pattern or learn from someone's prayer life, I think Nehemiah would be a great person to learn from because he cares enough uh, to pray. The book of Nehemiah opens up with prayer. The book of Nehemiah closes in prayer. This is one of actual 12 prayers that we know that are prayed in the book of, of Nehemiah. Nehemiah depended on the power and the ability of God. And you and I are going to do anything in our life until we get to that place. Till we say, hey, listen, this isn't about my power and my strength. Now, he's going to use our talent. He's going to use our gifts this year, uh, certainly. But it's going to be him through us. And he's going to get all the glory for any uh, good thing that's done. He begins with praise to God. This is the God of heaven. This isn't an idol somewhere who's the God of earth. This is the God of heaven. He is a great and he is an awesome God. It's actually uh, that phrase, the God of heaven, is used in the book of Ezra, in the book of Nehemiah. It's used several times, like four times, at least in the book of Nehemiah. He is the God of heaven. We're told to start our prayers, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He is a great, and he is an awesome God. When you are experiencing great affliction, and when you are undertaking a great work, when you need great power, when you need great mercy, when you need great goodness, then you need a great and powerful God. And I wonder, is the God that you're worshiping today big enough to handle the challenges that you have in your life? And the answer should be, yes, he is. He is the God that keeps his promises. He is the God that keeps his word. If you go back and read that prayer, we'll not have time to do that this morning, but if you got your Bible open, you can see what Nehemiah does. He said, Lord, you promised this. You said if they were unfaithful, you were going to do this, and you said if they could confess their sins, then you were going to bring them back home. You made these promises, and I know you're going to keep these promises, and so I can count on you to do that. Most of this prayer is devoted to confession. We don't like to talk about that today. I am a sinner, and I love, I love the fact that Nehemiah, even though he's not a part of this group, he's confessing, he, he says, this is my family, this is my country, this is my nation, if you will. And um, if you know anything about Achan in the Bible, 
in the book of Judges, you'll know, remember, Achan sins uh, at Jericho. And because Achan sins at Jericho, what happens is that he and his family are destroyed. But God doesn't say Achan sins. He says the people of Israel have sinned this day. And so one affected all. And so uh, he, this is what, he, it's a corporate prayer. He says, he's not saying they, you know, they did that. It's we, we did this. You know, we're, we're, we're confessing our sins today. And most of it is, is like that uh, in the book of, of Nehemiah. He's got confidence. He's got confidence in the power of God. He's got confidence in the faithfulness of God. And uh, Nehemiah, you know, he's not like Elijah says, I don't think there's anybody left. I'm the only one. Nehemiah said, I know there are some people like me that want to build something. And I hope you know that too. Sometimes I think we feel all alone. I think we feel like we're just on our own, you know. But I want you to know there are other people that want to do right. They want to build a godly life. They want to build a godly home. You're not, you're not the only one. And he's confident most of all, that God is going to have to work in the heart of Artaxerxes. Um, listen, this guy couldn't quit. Have you ever thought of that? He can't say, hey, by the way, here's my resignation, my two-week notice. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to have to head. I've got a real burden for Jerusalem. And uh, the uh, king might have said, hey, listen, you've been a good, good cupbearer, but I'm going to have to kill you now. Timing was everything. And it always is. Timing is everything. But he couldn't quit. He had to have the king's blessing to go. And so his part of his prayer is, Lord, you've got to make this guy's heart send me. I want to go, but he's going to have to send me. And by the way, do you, do you remember how he sent? He sent not only with the king's blessings, with the king's guards, with the king's money. He goes through the king's forest in order to chop the king's wood. He cannot be successful unless the king is on board with that. So, the, so God would have to change the heart of a king. All this stuff poli politically that's going on today, listen, well, you, you got to know, God can change the heart of any king. He can change the heart of any leader. He can change in a moment something that we think is going in one direction that needs to go in another. It's interesting that not long ago they were talking about one country that was uh, building up their, their, their nuclear uh, force and so forth. And then they had an earthquake and all of a sudden nobody talked about that anymore because their infrastructure was damaged. They were putting their country. But listen, you don't know what God's doing, but I know he is a great and awesome God. And he can work in the heart of any king and any leader. And he, in fact, the Bible says in his hands, doesn't it? In Proverbs 21 in verse 2, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. Why do you think Nebuchadnezzar attacked them to begin with all the way from Babylon? It's because God made it happen. So he's going to take care of us. He's going to take care of things. He is the great and awesome God. And he has a plan, even though you may, you may not. So a lot of times, we make a plan and ask God to bless it. <laughs> and uh, what we ought to do is say, God, give us a plan. <laughs> help me, help me this day. Help me get through this day. Help me, help, what is it that I need to do to make this happen? Change the heart of this, this employee or employer. Uh, help me, help me do what needs to be done. And then the last thing is that Nehemiah cared enough to volunteer. God's going to answer his prayer, but ironically, like God has done me and you, is he, it's hard for him to answer a prayer that we're praying without using us in that whatever it is venture. And so Nehemiah, one of the things I love, and please listen to me, don't fade out on me. One of the things I love about Nehemiah is he wasn't praying, Lord, you somebody else. Lord, I got a burden for this. Now, could you get another group of people to do it? Nehemiah had a burden to do something for God, and he wanted God to use him to do it. And his prayer was, Lord, you need to make this happen. I cannot make this happen on my own. And the only way that it will happen, in fact, you'll notice in the book of Nehemiah that God blesses them and blesses them and blesses them. And he even says, the only reason we were able to do what we were able to do is because God would bless us. So Nehemiah... He plans to volunteer, <laughs> and his, his heart is, here am I, send me. 
So the cub bear is going to have to sacrifice something. He's going to leave the kingdom, all the luxury of the kingdom. Why would you do this, by the way, unless you have a burden from God? He's going to leave a cush job, and he's going to go back to Jerusalem where there's going to be people that will attack him and make fun of him. From the moment he leaves the king's presence, he is a target to people all around him. And yet he was willing to do it in his own life. Instead of sharing, by the way, the king's bounties later on, you know what old Nehemiah does? He feeds people from around him from his own table. He's got it all, but he's willing to give it all up. 52 days they rebuild the walls. That's an amazing thing. What they couldn't do in 150 years, Nehemiah, because of God, does in 52 days. Abraham, I think, cared enough to rescue Lot from Sodom. David cared enough, brought the nation and the kingdom back to God. Moses cared enough to deliver the Israelites. Esther cared enough and risked her life so she could save her nation from genocide. Paul cared enough, he took the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. And Jesus cared enough because he died on the cross to save the whole world. I think God is still looking for people who care. People like Nehemiah who care enough to ask for the facts and not, not stick their head in the sand or ignore really what's going on around them. That are willing to weep and maybe not cry out loud but have some kind of emotion within them because of spiritually what's going on and then to pray like they've never prayed before for God's help in their life. And then maybe for the first time to volunteer to say, here am I, send me. Just as I am, I come broken. That's the song that we've uh, chosen this morning to sing at the end of the lesson. And like we do every time we meet together, we offer a, a, a time of invitation. Folks that maybe aren't New Testament Christians, that this morning you would, would give your life to him because he loves you. The only reason we can love him is because he has first loved us. That you might surrender your life that, like Nehemiah, confess sin to realize that you are a sinner and sin separates you from God, and that because of what Jesus did at the cross at Calvary, paying the price for you and for me, he made a way where there was no way that you could come and be a part of heaven's citizens even today, that your name would be written down in that Lamb's book of life, that today you could have every sin washed away, that you would be raised to walk in baptism in a brand new life, that maybe even today, as this, this is your day, that you would care enough to do something about your own life. And then maybe for some of us who have already done that, that we begin to question and ask God to help us about our caring. Over time, it happens to all of us. We get a little uh, jaded, you know, we get a little hard-hearted. And uh, maybe in the past, maybe because we've been hurt or because we did get involved, and it didn't turn out so good. We've just stopped asking. Don't do that. There are people hurting all around you. And it wouldn't hurt you to ask, are you okay? How can I help you? And it would be amazing what God will do in that ordinary moment, how you'll see him work in an extraordinary, an extraordinary way. And even this morning, I think we could allow that to happen. I'll be here at the front. An elder will be with me. If we can help you in any way, you come while we stand and sing the song of encouragement.